So my name is Pierre Yves and I'm going to be talking about uh, load balancing in OpenBSD and especially using the hosted daemon. So let me give a little history about the, the daemon. Uh, it actually switched names a bit so it was a bit confusing at first for, for people. I started by calling it SLBD for Server Load Balancing Daemon but didn't realize somebody else uh, already used that name. So there was a little confusion. Then it changed names again and again until we, we reached the decision that host state D was good and meant the host state daemon for load balancing. I, work on the, I worked on this between uh, OpenBSD 4.0 and OpenBSD 4.1 and it was introduced in 4.1 stable and, and release and that's why when people were able to try it out. Uh, Reg Floater worked, on with me, worked with me on this daemon and helped me um, implement layer 7 load balancing features which will be available in HostAD 4.2. So I'm going to give a little overview of this talk. Um, I'm going to try and introduce existing tools and concepts uh, that I'm going to use throughout the talk. Then, then explain the, the design uh, we want to reach with, with the host ID. Um, a little bit of the, um, the, the features, the tools that are provided give. And we'll talk about example configurations of what people really want to do with HostAD right now. And at last we'll talk about what's coming next, next in HostAD. So first, um, what is load balancing? I'm sure many of you already know that, but um, just to give a small definition, um, the goal of load balancing is providing a way to span a service across multiple machines. The typical situation is you have a, a web server that provides a dynamic service with PHP or Perl or whatever and <coughs> this application hogs your system and you're not able to service uh, user requests with only one web server so you're gonna you're gonna set up four or five web servers um, Maybe you'll do the same with your databases and and then you'll need something to to span the service and to <coughs> to you to have a single IP uh, servicing all these requests. So basically it functions either as an application gateway or proxy um, which is which is the difference between layer three load balancing and layer seven as we'll see later and and usually you use that in conjunction with high availability, which means providing a reliable service and, and having the option to fail over to uh, a backup service if everything goes wrong. So <coughs> host ID, uh didn't implement any, everything and relies on some of the features that were already present in OpenBSD and one of these is obviously PF which already had load balancing features um, first PF provides fast access address tables that are stored, stored sorry, in the kernel and a user -on interface to modify those tables either through PFCTL or, for, or through a set of IO controls uh, that it can use. PF also provides uh, different load balancing methods to access these tables. And as an example here, you have a row that says, um, let's redirect any incoming packets to this public IP on the HTTP port to these uh, web servers that are stored in a table. Oh, sorry. Another set of tools uh, in OpenBSD are CARP and PFSync uh, that are used for high availability and 
which helps you share a, a, a public IP, uh, knowing when, which is pretty much uh, like VRRP, uh, as some of you may know. So CARP handles the virtual addresses and PFSync uh, handles state synchronization um, across firewalls to, to provide a secure and transparent failover between firewalls. Some of the features we, we used in OSTAD are uh, the fact that CARP interfaces can be grouped together and that a CARP group, once it is created, can be manipulated from userland, which is especially useful if you detect a, a software failure and you decide that the machine isn't able to provide a service anymore and then you fail over to the backup host forcibly. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of what the real difference between layer 3 load balancing and layer 7 load balancing is, since we're going to talk a lot about that later. Um, layer 3 happens at the packet level, which means uh, when, an, when a packet comes in on a gateway, uh, its IP is inspected, and then the destination uh, IP is rewritten. So basically it's an extension of NAT and in PF it is just that, it is just another form of writing NAT rules. So it is pretty simple in essence and it is, it is really fast. Layer 7 happens at the application level. So it is, it is just a proxy uh, basically. Uh, you are in the middle of a connection, you receive a connection, you terminate it, and you initiate a new connection to your destination hosts. This allows packet processing, and this is especially useful in uh, environments where SSL is required because um, you need, <coughs> in order to provide a single cert certificate, uh, you need to, to terminate the SSL connection on the inbound. So with all these tools, uh, there still was a need for a unified load balancing solution in OpenBSD. <coughs> when you load balance uh, a service, you, let's say you have, four, you have four web servers, you want to know which ones are currently running and not direct uh, IP packets at them if, if they are not up. So knowing when a service fails was something we needed. We needed. We needed a tool that is able to maintain address tables because when a service fails on a server, I wanted to, to be able to remove it from a, a PF table. And we needed a tool that can provide a solution to general failure, which means I have no hosts anymore. Uh, I want to switch over to a, a server that says, sorry, we're not available right now, which is which is useful in many cases. And well, I wanted to be able to create uh, PF rules on the fly without relying on a set of scripts. So similar uh, applications already exist. Uh, commercial vendors, of course, provide uh, such solutions. F5 with Big IP, Nortel with Altions, and Cisco with many different types of services. Uh, of course, I wasn't really happy with that because uh, I love BSD and open source. And there were also a few Linux projects uh, that, that provide um, load balancing solutions, but which I found limited in many ways. Uh, for instance, Keep Alive D. Uh, all of these rely on a, a similar thing as PF tables, which is uh, IPVS, which provides more too, but in a different way. So well, the, the open source offer wasn't uh, really, really, really wide, so, and I decided we, we needed another tool. So these were the, the initial design goals of OSAID. First, security, of course, because uh, we were going to, I was going to write a tool that 
will mess with uh, the kernel and the firewall. Uh, a tool that will check uh, hosts at a very high rate and privilege separation where was going to be needed to, um, to make sure each task runs in a CH route and doesn't do anything else that it's supposed to. Efficiency, since uh, Load Balancer is here for efficiency and, and spanning your service across multiple servers and improving your, um, your request rate. So efficiency was, was, was needed. Simplicity, because uh, that's a, a concept we, we love in OpenBSD. Uh, I wanted to, um, to provide the same kind of uh, configuration file syntax that is found in other daemons in OpenBSD and a consistent syntax too because even though um, <coughs> at the app in the design layer 3 and layer 7 are really different things uh, from the administrator's point of view it is basically the same so I wanted a consistent, consistent sorry, syntax and last, uh, something which I've found really missing in other tools is an administrator-friendly tool which would let you check what's going on and take action and we'll see later wh what we can do with the tools provided. The actual design of HostAD is based around four types of processes. Um, there is a parent process which is used to start the daemon as a whole. This process handles uh, configuration loading and reloading. It doesn't do much because it runs as root um, and it is thus the, the most important part of the security wise, it's the, the most important attack vector. So it handles only configuration file loading and reloading. It handles Exec external script execution, as we'll see later what this is used for, and curb the motion requests when some other part of the application thinks the a curb interface should fail over, the parent process handles it. The other type of process is HCE, which is only one processes actually, which is the host check engine and which is a fast monoprocess uh, scheduler for host checks. It handles um, a lot of type of a lot of different types of checks uh, to to see if a host is up. We'll see exactly what type uh, later. Um, it is fully asynchronous and um, it is able to yeah to schedule checks and notify another process of straight transitions for. There's also a PF engine, which is only here to listen to incoming requests from the host check engine and take action uh, as far as PF is concerned. That is um, modifying PF tables, uh, creating PF rules, RDR rules uh, mainly. Uh, it is, <laughs> oh, this is a little mishap here. Um, we have a fourth type, a fourth type of process which is the only one that is forked more than once and which is the really engine use it, used for uh, layer 7 load balancing. It creates listening sockets for all services, it loads um, SSL certificates whenever needed and it filters protocols before relaying connections and we'll see how that happens a little bit later. I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about how things happened. Um, I didn't invent anything when doing that since I, uh, I took a lot of code from the existing daemons in, op in uh, OpenBSD, especially OSPFD actually, uh, which was my main basis. Um, I took safe buffer routines uh, found in BGPD which are also found in, uh, in OSPFD actually. And I use the iMessage protocol that is becoming 
very common in OpenBSD daemons right now. This protocol is just a method of communicating between different uh, search-rooted processes. All my four processes run a specific task, but sometimes they need to communicate with uh, another one, and that's when the a message protocol comes into play. So whenever HCE needs a a PF rule to be changed, it sends a message to PFE, the PF engine, and says with a specific type of message and a content, and action will be taken by the PF engine. Since we were going to do a lot of uh, SSL type um, stuff in, in host HostAD, specifically checking hosts that run SSL services, uh, we needed a set of asynchronous SSL functions which were created to, to be able to check many SSL servers at once. And last, uh, I used, like OSPFD actually, uh, libevent, which was developed by Niels Provost to, um, to facilitate asynchronous so socket programming. Well, libevent is, is useful in the way that uh, it, it, it hinders the actual type of asynchronous uh, socket routines that are used. In our case, it is KQ, like in, in FreeBSD but it can also use pull or select. So it was a pretty easy way to get started. Before we talk about the, the actual configuration of the daemon, um, I'm just going to go through uh, the different types of elements that were created for state D. Our basic element is a host which means a service provider. A host is something running a service on a certain port. A table will be mapped to a PF table and means a group of hosts providing a common service on a common port. And then we have the concept used for uh, layer 3 load balancing and layer 7 load balancing. A service means a virtual service at layer 3 and it defines a an IP to listen on and a table to use as we'll see later. Uh, a relay is a layer 7 load balancing declaration and it does just the same only that the table used will be will be used at layer 7 and a protocol is a helper for relays to manipulate connection as they go through the layer server 7 load balancer. Is this clear for everyone? Yeah. So the typical layer ser level 3 setup uh, when you're running a dynamic web service is having one internet reachable host which is going to be the, the load balancer uh, listening on a, a public IP and usually on a different uh, network, on a, either through VLANs or network different network interfaces, having other web servers uh, listening on the same broadcast domain as the load balancer. And so the incoming connection will go through the, the load balancer, the load balancer across a private broadcast domain and go through the load balancer again to reach back the internet. So this is what it looks like um, as far as configuration goes. There's a simple statement to add to PF to let HostAD ma manipulate it. <coughs> and then a simple configuration file, uh, hostAD.conf. Uh, well, as other demons in OpenBSD, we, we can have macros. Here we only need two concepts we saw earlier, the table, uh, which, are, which we call <coughs> web hosts. We define the port it listens on, uh, a check method, and two hosts. The check method just says for each of these hosts, 
connect through HTTP and check that when we request, request slash the code is 200. We'll see the, the other methods that are, that are available later. And then we define a service, uh, 3W, which uh, listens on this address and redirects um, requests coming in for port HTTP to this table. We also can specify the interface this all runs on. So, once this is done and hosted is started, um, an RDR rule will, will be created and a PF table will be created containing these two hosts provided uh, their service is reachable. And this is what it looks like uh, from the administrator's point of view. Um, host HTTL allows us to, to show what's going to show what is going on inside and we see our three concepts here uh, our two hosts that are marked as up since the two hosts are up the table is active and since the table is active the service is active as well so the, the role is in PF and the, the table is populated with the two addresses Before we go on, this is what we can do with host HTTL. We can do forcible host uh, disabling, maybe because uh, we, want, we want to take a web server out of a pool to bring Apache up to date or to change something in the application. And we don't want requests going to that host at this moment. Maybe we want to do this on a full table a full set of hosts so we can take a whole pool of hosts down with table disable uh, and re-enable it later with enable and of course this, uh, this can also happen at the service level so this is the three types of command we can use reload uh, reloads the configuration file rewrites the configuration file and starts up the daemon again um, right now reload only works for um, layer 3 configurations. Uh, a layer 7 configuration cannot be reloaded at that time because it will have to reload SSL certificates and right now this cannot be achieved. Um, of course we can, as we, as we just saw, we can display the status of just about everything uh, either uh, by specifying what kind of elements we want to show or by asking for a summary display. And the last uh, feature of hosted CTL is the monitor mode, which, which jump, dumps incoming events, and especially HCE, the host check engine events. This mode, either by calling host CTL or by directly uh, asking for the AF Unix sockets it, it runs on, uh, can allow different types of programs that might not need uh, load balancing features but that want to know the status of a set of hosts uh, they can connect through the monitor mode and um, use that use that data uh, typically um, I have I have run several uh, little monitoring tools that rely on this and we can talk about it later And these are the table options uh, we can use in host ID, especially the checking methods. Um, most of the time people run HTTP or HTTPS uh, services through load balancers, so there are two types of checks that are available. First, a HTTP code status check, which is just going to ask for a, just going to do a head request on a URL and and see what the status code is but sometimes that's not enough because um, in in many places uh, you cannot rely on the on the status code and and you want to see what a page actually outputs especially in places where you're afraid of defacement 
So what you can do is take a Shawan uh, digest of a page and rely on it to not change and you can ask for that and we can see later that it's really simple to, um, to implement. ICMP checks uh, can be useful if you're uh, not able to, um, to know what data to, to ask for and if you just want a simple, a simple check. For other types of protocols, um, we implemented a send expect uh, feature that just allows you to send a string of data and expect something back uh, on a socket. For instance, uh, let's say you're running a SMTP service and you want to load balance it. What you're going to do is send nothing because it is possible and expect a, an SMTP banner with a host name. And if you get that, you can. <coughs> it's more likely that the service is running and the host will be in a, in a table. For more complicated uh, scenario, we didn't want to put a lot of stuff into um, HostID for all types of protocol, and we can rely on external scripts to be to be executed and given the output of the script, well the return code, sorry, of the script, we will take a host down or up. Uh, this is useful if you want to, uh, to have SNMP request, for instance, decide whether a host is up or down. And last, another set of uh, simple tests are simple TCP connections. If I can connect to a, a specific port, uh, for instance, if I, if I want to check a My, MySQL uh, 3306 port, I can use TCP, and which is also available for um, SSL ports. Other options uh, that are available are uh, specifying a real port, uh, specifying a, a timeout for a, for a table, because some pools can be allowed to, to respond slower than other pools, and the ability to start a table disabled. And this is a, a simple use case of a, a modified um, configuration from what I showed earlier, where we want to take action if we have no hosts in our, in our pool anymore. So we're just going to set up a table story server uh, with a simple check running on the load balancer itself. We are going to set up a small HTTP server on the load balancer, either with Apache or another high-speed um, <coughs> web server. And in the service definition, we'll just have to add a backup table, which will be used only if this table is empty. And in that case, uh, that is what HostageCTL shows. Uh, it shows here our two hosts being down, our table being thus empty. Since it's empty, uh, this table, which is active, is used, and the service, def the service line shows it at the end. So this is, this is useful for, uh, for displaying a story page, but it, it's also useful, as I said earlier, when you're working on a when you're working on your um, bringing your uh, PHP application up to date, uh, you want to take your pull down, bring it up to date, and bring the service back up. And you can do that with state CTL. Which is how we're going to do it, by simply saying, uh, bring this table down by its name. And, the, and then we'll see that the the table has simply dis disappeared and is marked disabled and our service is still active using the backup table. So this is the administrator friendly, friendly part of, of HostAD. <laughs> and these are the, the layer 7 features. Uh, generic TCP relaying, if we want to relay uh, a service we don't know about yet in host ID. 
of course HTTP and HTTPS relaying, which means uh, that it's possible to to forward from HTTPS uh, to HTTP real hosts, which is useful when when you want to have a a fast load balancer and you have a, an expensive um, PHP application resource wise. You span it across four or five servers that are running HTTP, plain HTTP, and you handle the SSL termination on the load balancer side. And right now, well, you can also do HTTPS from uh, from end to end, which is required in banking environments and such. And then comes the DNS relaying, which is really new, which won't even be available in 4.2, uh, OpenBSD 4.2, because it came after, uh, which provides, uh, which spans uh, across multiple DNS servers and inserts um, randomization in the DNS IDs uh, to protect some DNS servers that aren't reliable as far as IDs go. Of course, we cannot achieve uh, generic UDP relaying for other protocols, and um, this won't happen since uh, it's a stateless protocol, and we wouldn't know uh, which hosts, well, which uh, session a packet um, is for. So, <coughs> so you mean this could be used? At, I'm talking about the HTTPS. Yeah, on the on the load balancer and, and the sort of clear text uh, web servers behind. Yeah. Has this been tested with, with some sign of some kind of crypto accelerator so you can have a front end that, that perhaps like the VSC seven that are very weak in CPU but can do crypto very fast and then you have sort of heavy machines behind but uh, that doesn't do crypto very Yeah, ex well that's that's what it's uh, used for uh, actually by uh, some commercial products uh, right now. Uh, and I, I actually used that specific configuration at work, uh, where we uh, we st we stuck a, a crypto Excel card uh, in a, in the in a load balancer, and only do HTTPS on the on on this machine, and then have HTTP hosts uh, doing clear tests on the back end. And yeah, uh, most the high even cards uh, work good for that for medium-sized applications and certainly bring the, the cost down because otherwise you have to go with really high-end um, servers to do that. So let's look at a, a small HTTPS relaying config. Um, I left out the service part, uh, so it's a layer 7 only configuration. And we still have our tables with our two web hosts. Um, here we have the relay, which looks a lot like the service definition. Only that um, here we sp specify a protocol um, and say, um, here I am going to relay. And while I'm relaying, I will open two headers that I can use in my in my logs to uh, to know who uh, otherwise in Apache logs I'm not able to to know who the connections uh, come from. I will also um, <laughs> shut down um, things like um, keep alive connections to um, to ensure uh, my <coughs> my traffic is well load balanced. Because if um, if requests coming or come back with keep alive specified, uh, of course I will stick to one host, and this is not the behavior I want. In that case, I assume you want to listen to port HTTPS uh, relay uh, the listen line in the relay section. You're right. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I, I messed up because uh, yeah, of course the table here is composed of HTTP hosts, and yes, here I should be listening on for for free. We have free relaying methods uh, available uh, right now. I think the most important one is the table forwarding because 
it is the most consistent with the layer three configuration. I just I can even use uh, the same table. Actually, uh, it is also possible to use fixed forwarding, so a one-on-one -on -one mapping, which is a pure um, reverse proxy uh, configuration, and use the address specified in the service too. That is also possible. I'm going to try and make it fast to <laughs> fit in the schedule. Um, as far as actions uh, that can be taken, well, HTTP traffic goes through a layer 7 load balancer. <clears throat> I, can, I can work on a connection direction and take action on a specific set of things. I can change um, headers, I can open headers, I can remove a header, uh, filter connections whether a header is present or not, and uh, <clears throat> I can also feed a header's value into a hash that will, use, that will be used to um, select a host in a table. When I want uh, fixed host addressing, I mean every um, given it, every given head I'm sorry, I'm going to make a clear sentence. I can use I can use headers to make sure every type like specific type of HTTP traffic goes to a set of, uh, to a specific host and this is useful in when for instance you don't want a type of request to go to one host and another type of request to go to a different host. Um, I can also work on uh, get values in the URL and look for um, key and value pairs in there. So this is what we general, generally want to do with the HTTP. There are some things missing right now that will be added later and we'll talk about that a little afterwards. This is the variables uh, you can manipulate. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. And the remote address and remote port is useful to add to a in a header for Apache logs. Okay. I'm going to go quickly through that. Uh, we have other protocol options. Um, we can specify the types of SSL ciphers we'll use the session cache, the types of SSL uh, transaction we want to do. Same goes with TCP and setting options at the IP level, um, the size of a socket buffer and the TCP backlog. Just going to talk quickly about some things uh, people usually want to do with, uh, <coughs> with load balancers like load balancing across uh, different broadcast domains because sometimes you have a load balancer in a location and one of your hosts uh, moves to another location and that is hosted you can cope with that by tagging uh, traffic at is, as it comes in on, the, on, the, on an interface and you will just have to NAT the traffic that is tagged by hosted um, once it comes out. By default, the default um, hosted the configuration files um, already includes a tag um, for service <coughs> definitions. Hosted D can, can also be combined with CARB because usually you want um, load balancing, but you also want high availability for the load balancer itself. Um, the only thing that you have to do is run hosted D on all the hosts. Uh, that, that are load balancers and that share a single CARB address, which means you'll have uh, to not use addressless uh, CARBs, which means you have a, a CARB address and you also need uh, an address in the network on the underlying CARB interface CARB uses. Um, well, I'll talk about development later and We'll just see what the future holds. Um, of course, layer 7 reloading because it, it is a big showstopper right now. Um, 
adding more layer 7 protocols and more importantly conditional tables conditional tables means um, if I see a, your, a cookie, if I see a session cookie, if I see a, a specific type of header, maybe I want to use a different kind of table altogether to, um, for instance, say, um, if I request um, a URL, URL of slash static, I want to go to my static pool and <clears throat> otherwise everything that ends in .php goes to my uh, PHP pool. And this will be possible, hopefully, pretty soon. And to stay consist consistent between layer 3 and layer 7, there are other things that I hope will, will soon end up being available. And the more important one is weighted hosts, because sometimes um, you have different kinds of machines in a pool, and one machine cannot service as many requests as other ones. So you want to weight it down, so it won't be, uh, you won't get as many incoming requests as the other ones. And this uh, this is also needed f to implement list connections, uh, which, if you want to 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 pull and weight down hosts dynamically based on the number of connections they get, you need this weighting fit feature. The future is, um, these are the more complicated uh, things we're thinking about. Uh, GSLB means global, global server load balancing. I'm not sure it's a, I think it's a commercial vendor only word right now. But basically it means um, when you have load balancers in different uh, locations, in different physical locations, uh, you might want to uh, to say I'm going to take that site down uh, definitely because I don't have any any service to provide anymore. So you can do that through DNS, uh, and that would mean having a a DNS server that accepts dynamic updates and <coughs> sending requests to it when when a service is completely down to and. For instance, let's say you have two locations, so you, you put um, in your DNS configuration, you have a DNS load balancing address with the two IPs of your two locations. And when one of the sites comes down, it sends a request to the DNS server to remove one of the addresses from the, the DNS configuration. And this can also be done with BGPD, and it's actually going to be simpler <laughs> to do, I guess, with uh, OpenBSD since we already have uh, a <coughs> in-house BGP implementation. And this would mean if I cannot service a, a request anymore, I will stop announcing my my address, my addresses through BGP, and traffic won't come to my data center anymore. Um, one of the other features we're thinking about, but um, it's actually, I'm not sure it will ever end up in host ID. We'll see about that if we, if, we, if we can find a clean way to do it. It's direct server return. Um, this feature is a little tricky. It's, it's a feature that allows you to um, load balance incoming requests, but requests coming out of the real service go through, well, don't go through the load balancer. So what happens is you load balance at the ARP level and not the packet level. And it's, it's a little tricky and it's a little, um, it's a clear violation of OZ layers. So I'm not sure we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> And finally, uh, one of the things um, we want to, to see ending up in, in HostAD and in OpenBSD as a whole is TCP splicing, which means uh, for the layer 7 load balancer, uh, once, you, once you're finished treating headers and, uh, and once you're, uh, you, you have decided what hosts uh, a session goes to, you just bind two sockets together and 
you, you don't go through user land again to read from a socket and write to another one. You just let it uh, come in and, and go out through the kernel. So that's about it um, for Stady. I hope I didn't push the schedule too much. Thank you, and I hope you can visit uh, openbsd.org and if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me. Is there anything uh, in particular to consider if you want to use CORP and uh, SSL for, uh, if you want to do this SSL proxy thing yeah. and CORP, uh, will the uh, SSL sessions somehow be uh, synchronized between the different hosts? No, there's no well, there's nothing uh, specific to CARP and Hostedi right now. Uh, so uh, it would be transparent if one session is in progress on one host and the server goes down and then everybody just fade over to the other one. Or will you? If you're at layer three, it's going to be transparent. If you're at layer seven, it's it's not going to be. Obviously, because yeah. since you're terminating connections, even for standard HTTP, you're going to have to to break connections when CARP fails over, because that we won't be able to recover right now. I guess that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're Thank welcome. You. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>